Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dalton Humphrey, a PhD student at Iowa State University. So Dalton, I know you've been on the show before, but it's been a while. So before we start, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself? Hey, Clayton. Thanks for having me this morning. Uh, Like Clayton just said, my name is Dalton Humphrey. I'm a current PhD student here at Iowa State studying swine nutrition with Dr. Laura Greiner. Um, grew up in Michigan, really involved in 4-H and showing pigs, and kind of spurred my interest in livestock. And from there, that led me to pursue a degree in animal science at uh, in junior college at Blackhawk College in Illinois, and then finished my bachelor's in 2019 at Western Illinois University. During my undergrad, I had a couple of really good internships that led me to pursue my master's here at Iowa State with Dr. Greiner. I started that in 2019. My master's work focused on impacts of a few feed additives on growth finished pig performance, nutrient excretion, and gas and odor emissions. Um, since finishing my master's, I obviously started my PhD and have switched gears a little bit. My research now focuses on amino acid metabolism and requirements, largely branch chain amino acid requirements in nursery pigs and lactating sows. Yeah, so I read that study you just mentioned about the different branch chain amino acid levels in the nursery diets. And we've had some episodes in the past about branched-chain amino acid interactions, which have been quite interesting to me. So for this study, when looking in the nursery, what did this tell you about how those nursery pig utilizes these amino acids? Yeah, so we know the the branched-chain amino acids being leucine, isoleucine, and valine are all three dietary essential amino acids, right? And so we know we have to provide them at some level in the diet. Um, But with that, there's various levels of those amino acids in the common feed ingredients we're using. So corn, soybean meal, DDGs, um, but also the relative balance of those amino acids are also very different in some ingredients. And so that becomes particularly important with the branch chains because we know there is this branch chain amino acid antagonism or interaction that does does exist due to the shared catabolic pathway of these amino acids where excesses of one or two of the branch chains may result in a deficiency or marginal deficiency in the other one or two, ultimately leading in reduced performance. Um, In terms of nursery pigs, um, a lot of the research out there previously is largely focused on either one or two of the branch chains at one time. And so there's still kind of, there was still kind of a lack of the full picture or full description of what these relationships really looked like from that perspective. And so our, our objective of this nursery study was really to try to quantify more and really better understand the relationships between the three branch chain amino acids. And so to accomplish that, we used two groups of 240 pigs, so a total of 480 pigs, um, and received those pigs at weaning um, and put, penned those pigs into 40 mixed sex pens and then just fed them a, chi- a common diet for 21 days post weaning. After that, so kind of the start of what most people would consider the third phase of the nursery at about 13 kilos, we randomly assigned those pens to one of 15 dietary treatments. And so those diets were arranged in what's called a a central composite design. And so what that is, it's a type of fractional factorial design and it by a very specific layout or spacing of those levels of the amino acids in the diet we're still able to estimate linear, quadratic, and then interaction effects with a significantly reduced number of dietary treatments. And so those diets consisted of various levels of leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And so um, for uh, we were expressing all of these relative to lysine, as we would commonly do. Um, And so our leucine to lysine values in this study ranged from 98 to 180%. Isoleucine to lysine ranged from 46 to 64, and then valine to lysine ranged from 51 to 78. And so we accomplished those diets by adding synthetic leucine, isoleucine, and valine by, in replacement of cornstarch and glycine and kind of a base diet that we had formulated. And that allowed us to keep those diets isocaloric as well as isonitrogenous and then equal in all other ingredients. And then also formulate that in a way that all other essential amino acids were provided at 5 to 10% above requirement. Um, from there, we were really interested primarily in growth in this study. And so 
we weighed weighed those pigs and measured feed intake throughout the study to uh, to then calculate average daily gain, feed intake, and, and feed efficiency. Um, from there, we fit a model in R that would be considered a second order polynomial response model. And so, kind of as I alluded to with the central composite design in that model, we had the linear and quadratic effects of leucine to lysine, isoleucine to lysine, and valine to lysine ratios. Um, there were two way interactions as well as initial body weight was fit in that model. And so, from there, we saw a few things. Um, in terms of average daily gain, we saw that valine had a linear and quadratic effect to average daily gain, regardless of the leucine to lysine and isoleucine to lysine levels. But we also saw, which was pretty interesting to us, that there was an interaction between leucine and isoleucine, where if both isoleucine and leucine were elevated or extremely high in the diet at our upper levels of 180 and 64 with leucine and isoleucine respectively, we saw that that really negatively impacted growth performance of those pigs. But at the same token, we saw that as one of those amino acids was increased while the other one remained low. So if leucine, for example, was increased in the diet, but isoleucine was still low, that actually improves performance. And so we saw this type of inverse relationship there. Um, in terms of feed intake, we saw that isoleucine did not have any impact on feed intake, but there was an interaction between leucine and valine with feed intake. We commonly hear about leucine having a negative impact on feed intake of pigs. Um, in this study, we did see that, but only when valine was at marginal levels. So we saw when valine was at marginal levels, increasing leucine in the, the diet reduced feed intake. But if valine was provided at a level that we would consider adequate or above NRC 2012 requirements, elevating leucine up to the ranges in this study did not negatively impact feed intake. And then lastly, feed efficiency had a really similar story to average daily gain where again, valine had this linear and quadratic effect to feed efficiency, and then leucine and isoleucine had a significant interaction where when both of those amino acids were provided at excess in the diet, we had a reduction or poorer feed, into feed efficiency. But again, as one was increased and the other remained low, we saw improvements or opportunity to be more optimal in feed efficiency. And so at the end of the day, this study really showed us that the Interactions between the three branch chains are very complex, particularly in this age of pig um, and in the practical ranges that we really evaluated. So evaluated. So there really isn't like this one answer of what level should we be at on these three, because we like to think of the amino acids as, as having a requirement, right? An individual requirement. And so here we saw with the branch chains in particular, we really couldn't do that. Um, and so kind of our recommendation here is really your levels of the branching in the diets are really going to depend on feed costs, right? And how that may impact performance on the back end and what is the financial incentive to change your levels based on your ingredient availability and that sort of thing. And so we saw there was some flexibility in what levels you could formulate to and achieve similar performance at various levels of the branch chains. And so, um, as part of our goals and results of this study, we hope to, to publish a uh, performance prediction calculator um, on our on Iowa State's website as kind of a tool for producers and nutritionists to use to kind of predict or evaluate what differences they would expect to see and kind of figure out where their optimal levels would be in their respective system. Combining basic science with real-world facilities results in swine nutrition programs that deliver impactful, bottom-line performance. Hubbard Feeds is focused on helping you achieve your goals and make your life easier along the way. Choose a company that can match your appetite for innovation by visiting hubbardfeeds.com forward slash swine research. Well, I think that's all we have time for, Dalton, so thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for, for having me. I really appreciate your time. Yep. And to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And we are constantly on the lookout for the latest updates in swine nutrition. 
And if you have a swine nutrition related research trial that you would be able to share on our podcast, please send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to talk about your research. See you later.